Hey, uh, good morning. You might not recognize me. I'm Pastor Jim. Uh, the heritage class and my wife were putting tremendous pressure on me to get a haircut. So the day has come. The teenagers were very disappointed, though, I got to tell you. They said, oh, Pastor Jim, you're looking like a skater, man. You cut it off. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, in Manhattan Beach, California, down south, there's a lot of churches, but one church meets behind Lifeguard Tower 42, and people show up in their uh, board shorts and their swimsuits, and they got their beach chairs and their towels, and, and they bring their acoustic guitars, and they have worship, and a pastor comes out and preaches. There's another church called Surfer Church in Hawaii. And uh, what they do is they all bring their boards and everything, and they go out for a surf session. They come in, have a meal together, and then they have church right there on the beach. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, there's a church in Rossville, Ohio, called Broken Chains Biker Church. And they all show up with their Harleys, and uh, they do a little ride, and then they all meet up at a cafe and have church there. The dress code is black leather, tattoos, and jeans for this church. And, and all the bikers here said, yeah, amen. Right, right. I have some friends that started a church that's kind of a mobile church, and each Sunday they meet at a different winery. How do you like that? And when they have communion, I'm sure there's not grape juice in the cups. There are churches that meet in movie theaters, golf courses, bowling alleys, bars, schools, and homes. Some of you might remember uh, Robert Schuler's church and the Crystal Cathedral down in Southern California in Garden Grove. They met for years in a drive-in movie theater. A lot of you have heard of uh, Rick Warren and Saddleback Church down in my hometown, Mission Viejo, California. They met in school, elementary schools, high schools, colleges, uh, up to the point where I think their church got to 10,000 people. And they still didn't have a building. And they were making it work. I heard of a church called Faith United Church of Christ in Pennsylvania that has a kayak worship service. You bring your kayak, you paddle out to the middle of the lake, and they have church. They sing songs, <laughs> and they worship. And then there's Calvary Community Church of Manteca. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> God has blessed us with 25 acres, and we're able to have church in a park-like setting under the shades of these beautiful trees. You know, and this is where you might want to start off with your note sheets here. There's a perception that must change. And that is that the church is not a building, right? The church is people. The church is a body. It's the body of Christ. The Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 that Jesus Christ, he's the head of the church. He's the savior of his what? Of his body, the church. So another word for the church is the body of Christ. Jesus is the head and you and I, we're the arms and the legs and the, the hands and feet and the toes and the ears, the eyes and the nose, all right? We're the body of Christ. It's when we gather. This is the church, folks. Amen? This is the church. And by the way, a lot of you have mentioned to me, hey, pastor, we kind of like meeting out here. <laughs> it's kind of fun. It feels good to be outside. So who knows, maybe in the future we'll just do this in May or June or wherever it's nice out. We'll just take a break from the building and I'll come out here and enjoy uh, this great church property that the Lord has given us. So last week, as, as we're beginning this series in the book of Acts, we saw the Holy Spirit come, just whoosh, like a sound of a mighty wind. 
and, uh, and the Spirit was manifested, and the apostles were able to share the wonders of God in all sorts of different known languages at the time, and, and all the people that came for the Pentecost uh, festival uh, th- th- from Egypt and from Syria and Arabia and, and from Europe and other places, they were able to hear the good news in their own language. And they asked Peter, after he gave the first sermon, what shall we do? And he said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and and the gift of the Holy Spirit. By the way, we're going to have baptisms next Sunday. And if you haven't been baptized, you need to be baptized, okay? Don't worry about going to a special class or anything like that. I'm not sure the 3,000 that responded to Peter that day had to go to a special class before they were baptized. They simply believed that Jesus was truly the Son of God, the Messiah, and they were willing to commit their lives to him. And so they made that public declaration of being, uh, you know, (laughs) I think they were immersed, but I'm wondering where they got the water for that many people in Jerusalem. But that's something you guys can study and ask ask Pastor Google later. Um, But uh, but 3,000 trusted Jesus that day. As their savior. Now, now, if you're the apostles, you've got a big, 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 big situation on your hand. Now what? Right? Now what do we do? Some scholars feel that, you know, the Bible says 3,000 souls were saved that day. Some think, you know, maybe they didn't count the women or the children at that time. If you were to add them in, the church was many more thousands. What do we do? How do we gather? How do we do church? What are our priorities going to be? (laughs) How are we going to relate to one another and to our fellow Jews who haven't yet believed that Jesus truly is their Messiah? And so we're going to look at some of those questions. We're going to look at what did the earliest followers of Jesus do? How did they relate to one another? As the church began. And I think there's some good lessons for each one of us as well. So let's talk with God. Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day you've given us to be able to meet out here in the shade of these trees on this lawn. Lord, we're reminded that the church is much more than just brick and mortar, a building, that it truly is those who gather in your name and your family were a body of believers. So Lord, I pray that we might be able to uh, take a page out of the early church's book this morning and be reminded and challenged of what it means to be truly your church, your body. In your name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. I'm going to share with you three characteristics of followers of Jesus in that first church that should still be characteristics of our church as well. So followers of Jesus, first, share life and faith with one another. We share life and faith with one another. That's so important. That is so important. Did you know that statistics indicate that when people come and visit a church, if they haven't met and made at least a friend or two, within six months, they're gone. They might love the preaching, might love the worship, but if they haven't connected, they're going to go. That's why community is so important. It's one of the markers of Jesus' church on this earth that we share life, and not just life, but faith with one another. And so the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now that word devoted, highlight it, underline it, circle it. That's key. It wasn't a casual thing. The members of the early church, man, they were committed. They were devoted. The word means a single-minded commitment. 
Think of, a, think of an athlete, a world-class athlete, single-minded focus on their sport. I think of Michael Phelps, the great U.S. Olympic swimmer, most decorated athlete in Olympic history. The guys won 28 medals, 23 of them gold. Amazing. <clears throat> when he is in the prime of his training, he would work six hours a day, six days a week. Within a week's period of time, he would swim 50 miles or more. 50 miles. Some of us don't even get in our cars and drive 50 miles a week. This guy's swimming over 50 miles a week. You talk about devotion and commitment. I think that's the kind of devotion and commitment that the, that the early church had. And first, to, to the apostles' teaching. And so the early church would gather, and typically they, would, they, would, they were still Jews, right? And they would go to the temple, and the temple had different areas, and they allowed these, these followers of Jesus to kind of meet probably in like an outer courtyard or something. And they would sit there and listen to Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas. They would listen to them tell stories about Jesus and teach the principles of Jesus. You have to remember that the early believers, they did not have one of these. A nice bound Bible <laughs> with all the books of the Old Testament and the New Testament, they didn't have these. So how did they learn? It was all through story. It was all verbally. Yeah, there might have been some scrolls in the, in the, uh, in the temple and some of the synagogues of the Old Testament books. But as far as the life and teachings of Jesus, they had to hear that from the very mouths of those who were with him. And they were devoted to learning about their faith. How did they remember? Well, the Bible tells us in the book of John 14, 25 to 26, Jesus said this to his apostles. He said, now the things that I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, here we go again, the ministry and work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, in the lives of the apostles in the early church, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So when the apostles were teaching those new converts, those Jewish converts, those Jews for Jesus, all right, the Holy Spirit was speaking through them. And they were learning. One of our values is we open the book. Calvary has a great tradition of Bible teaching, and we're going to continue that. It's so important that on a daily basis, we're opening the book and allowing God's word to feed us spiritually, to encourage us, to challenge us. It's so important that we meet together in person or online. It's so important that we, that we meet in church <clears throat> or our life groups, and we're learning God's word together. But more than just learning, and I loved what... Um, what you guys said in, uh, in sharing about your life groups, the Todds, that they were learning, but they're also applying it. You know, Jesus' little brother, James, he was the leader of the early church in Jerusalem a little bit later on. He said, don't merely be hearers of the word and deceive yourselves. Do what it says. <laughs> if all we're doing... It's taking in and taking in and taking in, and nothing comes out. We're not applying it. There's a word for that. I'll let you think about that one. But that's really important. So the early church, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the next fellowship. Now, when I was a kid at the church I grew up in, we had a, a time called fellowship time. 
Anybody have that in church growing up? Fellowship time, right? And what fellowship time meant is that I could get some donuts. And that was exciting. I mean, my mom was the choir director in the church I grew up at. And, uh, and I did everything I could to endure the singing, to endure the sermon, so that I could go to fellowship time. And if I was lucky, I could sneak an extra donut, all right? And that's what I thought fellowship was. That's not fellowship. Fellowship for the early church was, yes, meeting together to learn about Jesus. It was worshiping together. But fellowship was sharing life together, building relationships. I love you guys sharing about some of the challenges that you went through and how people in your life group were there for you. That's fellowship. That's what it means. Having those relationships where we support and encourage one another, where we hold each other accountable. Folks, that's the church. We have a lot of relationships out there, and a lot of that stuff might not happen if we don't share Christ with that person. But when we have a relationship where Jesus is the center, then we get deeper on a lot of those levels, typically. The early church also... We're devoted to the breaking of bread. Peter and James and John, I think they remembered that time with Jesus, <clears throat> the Last Supper, where Jesus said, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. Remember the sacrifice that I made on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins. And so, they instituted that. They made sure that when they gathered with these early converts to Christianity, that they took of the bread and the cup. And that's why we do it on a regular basis. That's why we do it this morning. And finally, they were devoted to prayer. That's another one of our core values. We look up. We look up to the Lord and worship. We look up to the Lord and speak to him. We talk to our God. We don't just talk about God. We talk to our God. And if we're smart, we'll take a little time, settle down, and allow him to speak to us and listen. If you thumb through the book of Acts, you're going to see that any time the church needed guidance, any time that the church was in crisis or being challenged, they looked up. They gave it to the Lord in prayer. And God worked. I'm so excited to know that we have a lot of different prayer groups in our church. I'm so excited to know that prayer is a value that happens in our small groups, life groups, when we meet. We need to be known as a church of prayer. Thank you for those of you who lead us in that value in prayer. I like to think of it this way. You might want to write this down. When we work, we work. When we pray, God works. Isn't that a great way to think about it? When we work, we work. We use our experience, our resources, our talents, whatever it might be, to deal with our issues. But when we give them to God in prayer, then he goes to work. And he wants us to talk to him and to give him our needs. And boy, did the Lord start to work in that early church. It says in Acts 2.43 that awe came upon every soul. You know, they were just kind of blown away by being together and by learning about Jesus and, and connecting the dots. He was our, our Messiah. This is so great. And God was was pleased with them. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, healings, miracles, and things that only God could do. So first, followers of Jesus, they, they shared life and faith with one, with one another. Secondly, they cared about the needs of others. <clears throat> Now, Jesus, he cared about the needs of others, right? When people were discouraged, he encouraged them. 
When they were sick, he healed them. When they were hungry or thirsty, he fed them. When they were enslaved by sin, he freed them. Jesus cared about people. That's what followers of Jesus do, right, folks? We care about people. We're not a selfish, exclusive club. And the, when the, if, if the day ever comes, when that's what we become, I'm out of here. Because I didn't come to hang out with a club. I came to be a part of a movement. A movement with you. Beginning in Manteca and spreading out to, to Lathrop and Tracy and Ripon and Modesto and Stockton and other little towns that I don't know about yet, all right? But we need to be part of the movement that was started here in the early church. Now, put yourself in the apostles' shoes. It had just been the 12, and then maybe about 120. That's how they started, right after Jesus died and was resurrected and ascended to heaven. Peter preaches the first sermon, and, and thousands come. And, and now <laughs> they got a church, they got a movement going here. And all these people had needs. There were those that needed food. There were those that needed clothing. There were those that needed shelter and other things. What do they do? Just say, hey, be blessed. God loves you. Good luck with that. No. It's amazing how the early church responded to the needs of each other. Look what it says. In Acts chapter 2, 44 to 45, and all who believed were together, and they had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Wow. I mean, that's amazing. They cared for one another, and they were willing to make sacrifices for one another. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you sold a car and took the money and brought it to the church and said, here, give this to the people who can't make their rent, or don't who have enough clothes or food? That's basically kind of what was going on there. Those who had excess or, or not even excess, they made sacrifices, and they sold things to care for one another. Pretty amazing. You know, uh, I was on a mission trip to uh, inner city, downtown LA, and uh, my group was connected with a woman who simply just called herself Sister Luz. Sister Luz. And she had taken her, her house and turned it into like a food pantry. And, and my group came and we were supposed to help her kind of uh, organize food and then go with her when she ministered to some of the people in downtown LA. And it was amazing. We went to this woman's house and every room was just piled with stuff. One room had cans of food everywhere. Another room had clothes for children. Another room had clothes for adults. Another room had, you know, other sorts of food. It was amazing. If you've ever seen that show Hoarders, you know what I'm talking about, okay? just packed. And so we were helping her out, but she had such a heart for people. Her house was a total mess. And I thought to myself, how can this woman live here? I'm sure there were mice and rats around. I mean, it was amazing. But she just smiled, went from room to room. Oh, let's box up some of this. Let's box up some of that. Get all this stuff. She had a couple of vans. We loaded them up. She led us down to a to an abandoned parking lot in the downtown LA area, and we waited. We set up little awnings and a little fold-up table, and then all these people started to come. And with a smile on her face, and in the name of Jesus, she gave them food and clothes. She prayed with them. I thought, wow, it's not about the nice house and the lawn. It's about being Jesus to these people, loving them, caring, not just about their spiritual needs, but their practical needs as well. We've got a guy in our church right now who is collecting things. 
he and his wife, and they're going to have a big garage sale and give the proceeds to those with needs. We've got a successful business person in our church, and when talking to him, he said, I want to be even more successful, sell more of my products, so I'll have more money to give to our church and to our community for the needy. Wow. How about you? How about me? Followers of Jesus, they care about the needs of others. The book of Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 says this, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everybody. And I'm so grateful to be a part of Calvary. We have fed the community during COVID. Literally. (laughs) We've received donations. And we have been a place where people can come and we distribute food. Not just a can here and there. I mean, I participated a couple times and man, we were filling up people's trunks with food. And not just canned food, meat. God, in Manteca, put his finger on our church and said, that one is ready. Calvary, you will feed the people during this trying time. Can we just give God glory and thanks for that right now as a church? Thank you, church. Thank you for caring about the needs of others. So the early followers of Jesus, they shared their life and faith with one another. They cared about each other's needs. And finally, they declared the good news of Jesus Christ with other people. Now, you don't have to look too far today to see people declaring things that they believe in, right? Just kind of this season. If you're on social media... People are declaring what they believe in, right? At least they are on my Facebook feed and Twitter and Instagram. Man, people are, you know, declaring if they're a Democrat or a Republican. They're declaring if they support the president or don't. They're declaring if they're for wearing masks or not. They're declaring uh, if kids should be doing distance learning or not. They're declaring if the virus is real or not. They're declaring what they think about the, uh, the peaceful protests and the riots and, and, and social unrest and all these different things. A lot of folks are declaring what they believe. Peter had something to declare. John had something to declare. Andrew and James and Thomas and Matthew, they had something to declare. What did they declare, folks? They declared that this Jesus, this popular rabbi who fed us, did these crazy miracles that we can't understand, guess what? He was the one we were waiting for for seven, eight hundred years. This Jesus who we crucified, he was the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one. And our salvation is found in him. Can I have an amen on that? That's what they declared. Now, you would expect it out of the apostles, right? (laughs) It's kind of their job. Jesus gave them that commission. What about their converts? What about these, uh, these Jewish people who had responded to the teaching and the preaching of Peter and the others? Well, it tells us in verse 46 and 47, day by day, Attending the temple together, and that's just where they went. They weren't going through all the older Jewish ceremonies. I don't believe anymore, but they went. 
to hear about the apostles' teaching. And breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So check that out. The early church, they were experiencing authentic community. That's one of our values. As Pastor Mark was sharing, they were, they were learning about Jesus together. They were building relationships with one another. They were sharing their meals with each other with grateful hearts. They were joyful. Folks, it was contagious. You talk about a contagious virus. Man, that was the early church. They were contagious. And all these Jews, probably they were walking around Jerusalem, were like, what is going on with these guys? They're so happy. They're joyful. They're not rich. They're not wealthy. But man, every time I'm around them, just I feel different. What do they have that I don't have? And it says what? They had the favor of all the people. In the beginning, there wasn't a ton of persecution. There was this contagious love and joy and gratitude and faith, and people wanted to be a part of it. And what was the result? Day by day, the Lord was adding those who were being saved. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. Where we're hearing of people trusting Jesus as their Savior on a, on a daily basis. Wouldn't that be cool, Calvary? If we really got off our butts. Sorry, I said butts in church. But wouldn't that be cool? If we were seeing people trusting Jesus as their Savior on a regular basis basis. Folks, that wouldn't have been happening if the people weren't declaring their faith to their friends. Not just Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip. No, the people, those that had trusted Jesus, they were declaring what they believed. They were declaring the good news of Jesus Christ to their friends and family. It had to have been. And the movement grew and grew and grew. Wow. And as we look through the book of Acts, you see these, these, these verses that Luke will put in there. He'll say, this happened and that happened, and the Lord added to their number. This happened, that happened, and more people joined the church. This happened, that happened, and some of the priests were being obedient to the faith. This happened, that happened, yada, 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 yada. And the church was growing. Awesome stuff. In the book of Acts. Now, I know how some of you might be feeling right now. Oh, great. Here we go again. The pastor wants us to be evangelists. I'm not an evangelist. I don't have an evangelistic bone in my body. I, I get all tongue-tied. I don't know what to say. I feel awkward. I can't do this, pastor. Please. Don't challenge me to do this. Don't tell me the, only, the early church did this. I'll, 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 I'll share and I'll care, but I can't declare, okay? Just don't go there, Pastor. I, I'm just not comfortable. I can't do that. Listen, I'm not saying that you've got to be Billy Graham or Billy Grahamette, okay? I'm not saying you've got to go down to Walmart and get a megaphone, stand on a street corner, and yell at people. I'm not saying you've got to get a bunch of tracks and go door to door and hand them out. But there are some things that we can do. We can share our story with our neighbors, our friends and family. We can share the hope that we have when our neighbors are going through a divorce, or when they've lost a loved one, or lost a job. We can bring encouragement. We can bring up God in a conversation, can't we? Church, we can do that. Can I have an amen, church? We can do that. You say, but I don't know where to start. How about start here? Pray that God might open a door for you to share. Now, that's a dangerous prayer, let me tell you right now. If you pray that prayer, Lord, open a door for me to share, there's a really good chance he's going to answer that prayer. 
and that you're going to be put in a position that if you are sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit's work and leading in your life, you're going to recognize that situation. And then the challenge is going to be, don't be silent. Speak up. Declare the love of God to this person. The Apostle Paul asked for prayers that God would open a door for him. He asked the the Christians at Colossians. He said, pray for us also, in Colossians 4, 3, that God may what? Open to us a door for the word. To what? Declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. If the apostle Paul asked for prayers that the Lord might open a door for him so he could share his faith in Jesus, I think you and I can do that. It's not below us. I remember uh, one time I was pastoring my first church and I sat down my office desk and I just, in my prayer time, I said, Lord, I pray that you would uh, give me an opportunity with someone that's really hurting, really lost, who has an empty, an empty place in their life, in their heart that can only be filled by you. Lord, open a door. The next day, I get a call from a guy named Greg who's in our church. He said, Pastor Jim, can you come over to my house? I said, when? He said, now. I said, what's going on? He said, well, my sister came into town unexpectedly. She's had a really hard life. She's going through a very difficult time. And I thought you just might be able to come and encourage her. She's not a Christian. And I looked up to heaven and I said, got it. So I went over. And she shared with me in tears. She was weeping at this kitchen table. I was hearing her story. I shared with her a couple of verses. I shared with her about God's love and asked her if she wanted to trust Jesus as her Savior. And she did. God opened a door. I believe God can and will open a door for you to share, to declare the good news and love of God through Jesus Christ. We just got to be willing to be the church. (laughs) That's what followers of Jesus do, folks. They share life and faith with one another. If you're not in a small group, get in one, please. Get in a life group. (laughs) Sundays are awesome. But in a life group, you're going to share life with others. You're going to build relationships. You're going to be able to share the things on your heart and your mind. You're going to be able to encourage others. You're going to get to be known, and you're going to know others. The early church, those followers of Jesus, they shared life. And faith, together, they cared for each other's needs, and they declared the good news of Jesus.